Hello, Happy New Year to you for 2021. And this is the seventh chapter of The Quest of the White Merle by Lillian Gask. <coughs> the Bird of the Widow of Titusan. In all his journeyings, Conrad had never been so tempted to linger in one place as in this fairy-like land of Japan. Even when he left the mountains behind him, it was still beautiful. Marvellous temples, the walls of which Minate had told him were inlaid with precious stones or painted with frescoes of radiant flowers, stood calm and peaceful, even as Fujisan and the quaint little houses were shrined in bloom that shaded from palest pink to deepest red, with the pure soft whiteness of pear blossom in between. Cherry and plum and peach trees made wondrous arches across the road where dark-haired boys and girls with the tints of summer roses glowing in their oval cheeks thronged the narrow pathways, clattering their wooden sabots and calling to each other like flocks of birds. Many of the little maidens who wore those bewildering butterfly garments of every hue had doll-like babies strapped on their backs, and the wee black heads bobbed to and fro as their nurses played at batten door and shuttlecock. But the babies laughed, and their sisters laughed, and the merry boys gathered in crowds round the snake charmers and conjurers who did such wonderful things, Conrad laughed too. All the children of all Conrad seemed to be happy in Japan, and finding it sometimes impossible to resist the longing to hide in a grove of plum trees and listen for a moment to what was going on over the way, he did not once hear an angry word. Boys flew their big kites unrebuked on crowded pavements, and bent old women made sweetmeats and strange white cakes in open braziers. Some of the cakes looked very tempting, so the comrade pined to try them. A sweet little otorasan in a kimono of palest purple caught sight of these bright eyes through the snowy bloom of a cherry tree in one of the miniature parks, and threw him up a thick slab taking it daintily from its wrappings of fresh green leaves. It tasted so delicious that Conrad only laughed when a Japanese sparrow told him that Otorasan had mistaken his eyes for a monkey's. He settled himself to enjoy it a little further on, where two forked branches of a gnarled old tree stretching over the water made a comfortable seat. Dragonflies with filmy wings and rainbow-tinted bodies swarmed on the lake of lilies, and a mandarin duck paddled leisurely between their smooth, wide leaves. He was as gorgeous as the dragonflies themselves, and the fan-tailed swoon of feathers that rose over his back from beneath his wings flashed burnished gold in the sunlight. He saluted Conrad with gracious kindliness but made it clear from the first that the only bird in which he took an interest outside himself was his own mate. Although less gaily attired than he, she was well worth looking at, and the Mandarin eyed her fondly all the time he was talking. A white male, you say? he questioned languidly. The cranes might have told you that they left some time ago for their summer homes in the north. I do not think the honourable bird with the curious wings will find her either here or in China from whence I came. And with another grave salute he sailed away. Like a floating emerald set in a sea of gold lay the island of Enoshima. The sunlight spangled the waves that rippled her sands and turned the winding street that climbed the hill of the little village into a fairy staircase. The sea had flung exquisite gifts to her, shells such as Conrad had never seen before, with the gleam of the dawn and the warmth of sunset in their twisted cups. Piled together in heaps like cherry blossoms that the wind had rifled from the orchards, they lay in open baskets and above them were the fluttering white sails that hung over every shop. For the moment no one was about, and Conrad, alighting quickly, thrust his hands among the beautiful things. As they fell through his fingers, a man and woman came to the open door, and he drew back into the shadow of the wooden shutters, that he might not be seen. The man was angry. 
There could be no doubt of that, and the little old woman was very sorrowful. But, although many times she bowed her head until it touched the ground and spread her hands, palms outward, as if to protect herself from her companion's wrath, she was evidently determined, and her parched brown face, as withered as an autumn leaf, was screwed up tightly. The man strode away at last, and as the little old woman went back into her inner room, a big crow balanced himself on the edge of the signpost and laughed aloud. There goes old Satsu, he called, and with all his wealth he cannot buy a sweet silver throat, the honourable bird of the honourable widow of Titu San. It is well for you, brown wings, that he did not see you. He covets all rare birds for his fine cages in the garden of many flowers. The crow was a very big fellow, almost the size of our British raven. He had no manners to speak of, and addressed Conrad with easy familiarity. You can call me Corvus if you like, he remarked carelessly. South family name, I believe. There are any number of us in different lands, and some cousins of ours, the jabbering crows of the Blue Mountains in Jamaica, are said to talk much as you do. The raven is another first cousin of ours, and so is the magpie. Both clever enough in their way, but by no means equal to us. And as he darted across the street to seize a piece of meat from the mouth of the dejected wolf-like dog, who looked quite out of place amongst the gleaming shells, he flapped the tip of a pointed wing in Conrad's eye. Crows are impudent birds, shouted Gladheart indignantly. They know better than to behave like that at home, though. If they did, they would soon be turned out of their own nests. You should see them bowing and scraping at courting times. It's... Won't you try this fine fat worm, my love, instead of snatching it away and gobbling it up themselves as they would if they dared at the end of the season? Corvus had swallowed the piece of meat by this time and fluttered back to them, quite unconscious of having given any cause for offence. Insolence of these dogs, he cried, and Conrad would learn by this time that no bird would talk to him about the white merle until he had had his say out prepared to listen patiently. When at last he asked if Corvus had ever seen the precious bird of the Honourable Widow of Titusan, the black crow shook his head. Never, he cried, but I have heard her sing, and her song is not unlike your friend's young friend's twitter. Sweet enough, what there is of it, but not to be compared with a stirring chorus of our call, call. You should hear us in the early mornings when our voices are fresh. You would know what melody it was then. I should know what it wasn't, thought Conrad, and in spite of himself the corners of his mouth turned up in a wide smile. Corvus looked at him suspiciously. I don't see what's amusing you, he said. But of course you have a right to keep your joke to yourself if it is too foolish to be shared. I intended to invite you to meet my wife. But you may not think it worth your while to come. I should like to know her immensely, said Conrad politely, and Corvus flew on ahead to a tall pine tree perched halfway up a rugged cliff. Mrs. Crow was at home, and so were her five youngsters. She was very reproachful when she found out that her mate had brought them nothing to eat. So like him, she called putting her head on one side with her martyred air as if she were very injured. I have to stay at home and feed the children while he amuses himself. Yes, it's a fire nest and I made all of these sticks, as you see. Why did you choose? we choose such a lonely place for it? Crows have to always keep to themselves at nesting times. You will seldom find two nests together. If you're thinking of those silly rocks, it's quite a different matter. I always thought, said Conrad mildly, that crows and rooks were very the same. Mrs. Crow eyed him with lofty scorn. A crow is not a rook, she said. If you used your wits, you would have noticed that rooks are smaller and have a differently shared beak. The upper portion of our bill is bent over the lower, and our wings reach the point of our tails. Rooks, too, are much more sociable than we are. 
They crowd their nests together as closely as they can, and chatter from morning till night, even before their eggs are hatched. I have no patience with them. Caw, 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 cried her nestlings, joyfully, as their father appeared, carrying a dead mouse. Ye promised us a little bird, cried the eldest with marked disappointment. Oh, I think it is time we were moving on, twittered Gladheart uneasily, and in spite of the united entreaties of the crow family, that the robin, at least, would stay with them, that lonely nest in the pine tree was soon left far behind. High up in the sky a lark was soaring, a small brown point in the dazzling blue, singing her heart out for pure joy. As she sank down again, Gladheart hailed her, and asked her how best they might see Silver Throat. Wait till morning, until twilight, she counselled, for then the Honourable Widow of Titusan may bring its gilded cage to her little veranda that faces the west. Here she watches each night when the stars come out, as if she thought they might sometimes flash her a message from her son. So Conrad stayed on the island of Enishima until the sky and the sea made a haze of mother of pearl, and the sun went to rest in clinging garments of mist. Then he thought the little shop belonging to the widow of Titusan, and found her sitting on the floor of the veranda behind it that looked out onto the west. Her sparse grey hair was gathered into a comb at the back of her head, and her small brown face was so lined and wrinkled that only the eyes in it looked alive. A gilded cage stood close by her, and in the soft tones of eastern people she murmured tender words to the bird inside. I wish I knew what she was saying, Conrad whispered to Gladheart, as he folded his wings closely and hid further in the shadows. Don't you understand? cried Gladheart wonderingly. She is telling her bird that she loves him. Such words have the same sound everywhere. After a little while, Titu San's widow put her withered hands inside the cage and brought out her treasure. As she held it lovingly against her face, the red on its feathered breast caught a reflected gleam of the sunset, and Conrad had much ado to stifle a cry of surprise, for the precious bird, for which the old woman had refused much gold and made herself a bitter enemy, was just a robin, and the song that brought her comfort, the echo of Gladheart's own. Thank you.